Hi, this is the Magnificent Midlife Podcast and I'm Rachel Lancaster. This is where we celebrate women in midlife and beyond. We challenge the status quo and bash those negative stereotypes about being an older woman. We're not over the hill at 40, 50, 60. We're just getting started. And the world needs us now more than ever. I'll be talking all things midlife, about issues that matter, and sharing fabulous stories of amazing women doing very cool stuff. Now is our time. There's been a huge hole in my podcast, over 130 episodes, the environment. So I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome Rebecca Wrigley, one of the founders of Rewilding Britain and now its chief executive. She has worked in the voluntary and public sectors for 23 years and is passionate about engaging local communities in decision making about their land and resources. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you. Honestly, I've wanted to have a spotlight on the environment and how we can do more with the environment for ages. So this is this is great. And I think Rewilding Britain is now nine years old. Is that right? It's about nine years old? Yes. I mean, there was a period of time before we actually launched where we were sort of setting ourselves up. But yes, uh, nine years old. Amazing. So how did it start? And why did it start? A combination of reasons, really. So what really kickstarted it was George Monbiot's book, Feral, um, which was on the theme of rewilding and probably was one of the first books written in Britain raising that as an issue. Uh, And many people contacted him to say, you know, we need to make something happen. We need to do something. And at that point, a slightly eclectic group of people got together and uh, including me, myself, and said, you know, let's do something. We've got to make this happen. And uh, I'd just been made redundant, actually. I had a small child, 18 months old, um, and I have a background in conservation and development. And as it turned out, when everyone was saying, yes, let's do something, um, no one else had the time to to do it, to get it started. So that's when I kind of stepped in whilst juggling a small child um, to, in the <laughs> phases of you know working out whether it was worth setting up an organization because God only knows there's many out there. So we didn't want to just set up another one if it wasn't useful or didn't have a purpose. And so we canvassed opinion and got, um, you know, a series, spoke to loads of people to say, do we need an organization and what should it focus on and what should its unique contribution be? And so that's where the idea, the the response was generally yes. um, And that we needed an organization to both push the boundaries of the debate and try and make it happen. So that's where the sort of birth of Rewilding Britain came from. So what is its unique contribution? Well, we do three things, really. And actually, it's a bit of a tightrope, kind of trying to balance those three things. So we catalyze change. So we help the kind of growing movement of rewilders to rewild and provide a peer learning network and support. And we have two sources of, of funding that we can use to support those people and projects. Um, and that's now got it in, I think it's in two years, we've now got over 200 members of that network who have at least 40 hectares or more. So that's around 200,000 hectares, which is quite a big area of people rewilding across across Britain. Then we also aim to influence. So we want to create an enabling environment for, for rewilding, um, both in terms of policy and legislation but also funding to help people to make that transition. And then in addition to that, we we want to engage people in rewilding beyond those that have access to land. So raise awareness, get people excited, inspire people, um, and get them to uh, take actions to support rewilding. So those are the sort of three things that we work on mainly. And what have been some of the highlights since you started? Oh, um, It's really interesting the way that it's sort of grown and we've found our place really almost, you know, organically a bit from the, from the life of hard knocks, um, you know, learning what we shouldn't be doing or where we don't add so much value. But I think, well, one, I think the network, you know, that kind of came out of uh, the sense that lots of people were coming to us to say, you know, how do I do this? So we set up the network didn't really have an idea of where that would go. And that's really sort of flourished. 
I think there's been some real wins in terms of uh, influencing. So I think it was three or four years ago, we set up a parliamentary petition and got the 100,000 signatures it takes to then spark a, a parliamentary debate on nature and climate and the role that nature has in addressing the climate emergency. Um, so there was a debate in parliament on that. And we we understand that that had a direct impact in setting up uh, the Nature for Climate Fund that the government set up a, a couple of years ago. So those are sort of two things that have been heartening for us, I suppose. But then, but then there's also, again, that sense of people's support for rewilding. It's, it's such a story of hope uh, in the face of what could be quite overwhelmingly gloomy. You know, the climate and ecological emergencies are real. And if we don't act, it will have a pretty devastating impact on our lives. But people have sort of engaged with us in a really positive way. So an example, for instance, is that we did a poll last year that said that over 80% of people in Britain support or strongly support rewilding. So there is this sort of groundswell of of support and a, and a burgeoning rewilding movement emerging, which is you know, just feels like a sort of fantastic progression from those early days of talking about how do we make this happen and should we set up an organisation? I saw about that report. I thought that was amazing. But people are in support of it, but what are they actually doing? Are they are they doing things to show support? I mean, yes, across a range of, uh, well, obviously those that are supporting it practically, those that are part of the network, and in addition to the kind of 200 people who uh, are actually rewilding pieces of land, there's another... 400 people that are members of the network and interested in the the sort of discussions that happen there and and learning from that. But then, and we're also expanding the work that we do in the marine environment in making sort of marine rewilding a thing. But I think people like the 100,000 people that signed um, that petition and the people that we got, for instance, people to respond to consultations to influence policies, for example, there was there's a policy called the environmental land management scheme which is the replacement that came after brexit for the common agricultural policy loads of people responded to to that so there's sort of indications all the time about people's willing to willingness to take action and we want to make sure moving forward that there are moments that they can they can do so and get sort of practically involved and what are some of the things that we can do so for example i live in north london um i have a garden I feed my birds, <laughs> not my birds, I call them my birds. We have foxes that I feed and I probably shouldn't feed them. But what can I do in London to to make a difference? I mean, there's various things. Uh, you know, what I would love to see, for instance, is rewilding happening from people's doorsteps right out, you know, almost in a sort of continuous corridor right up to the mountaintops. So it doesn't have to be perceived or seen as something that is distant from our urban areas. So I'd love to see urban rewilding groups or, or neighborhood rewilding groups, like we have neighbor, neighborhood watch groups, for instance, where people make decisions to start to take actions in their gardens or get involved in their local parks or in rewilding rivers near near them so that we've got these sort of corridors going out into the countryside because people think, well, how can you really rewild a garden? What difference is that going to make? And in and of itself, rewilding a garden is not going to have a ma- massive impact. But if you connect that up to multiple gardens and then your local parks, like in, in Derby, for instance, the city council has made a decision to rewild one of their parks that was had previously been a, a golf course. Um, and so maybe that's about then catalyzing people's actions around that. Um, people have got involved in that park and then they can see how can I you know, take, take da- down a bit of my fencing or create uh, spaces or, or ability for animals to move through the, your gardens, you know, for instance, foxes or hedgehogs. Or... So I think, um, I think there are practical actions that people can take as long as they start to connect them up and join with their uh, neighbours. But I think it's people's voice is really important as well, particularly politicians are very influenced by how ex- people express that voice. Uh, for instance, just before Christmas, there was a big reaction to some of uh, to the government saying that they might pull back on this environmental land management s- scheme oh yes everybody got very up in arms the national trust were like 
I know, Amazing, which is brilliant because they've got, <laughs> um, you know, the whole attack on nature, which, uh, you know, was a real rallying cry. And, it, and I think mm. the millions of members of the RSPB, National Trust, all the conservation organisations, that's a combined force yeah. that could really have a voice. That was amazing how that happened, wasn't it? Because I remember a lot of us were sort of despairing at the local, the, 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 the government's initiative that, you know, all land was going to be available for fracking. And it was like, no, 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 what's going on? You know, and where I live in North London, there, there is a lot of green space. There are those corridors. There's the New River, which goes all the way out to Hertfordshire from where I am now. And we can't actually walk along all of it, but we can... It, it flows and, and the bird life go up and down and then we have would-be wetlands and there's there's a lot of green spaces. So I love this idea of these corridors, building corridors. Well, there's a, a recently formed London Rewilding Task Force, which a, a colleague of mine is a member of. So urban areas can take a, a coordinated sort of, sort of almost strategic approach to this and say, we want to form these corridors and connect both physical areas but also all those local groups um that might be interested in their local park or in you know rewilding their gardens so they're sort of connecting people as well as connecting up pieces of land so i guess your website is the first port of call for anybody that really wants to get involved in doing something yeah and we we're kind of aware that um that we need to provide more opportunities i think so that will be emerging in the future and you know it's interesting we we still Although we're growing, we're still a small team. I mean, actually, we've we've grown massively just in the last year. Uh, we were, I think, in the last eighteen months, we've gone from twelve people to twenty people. So we are growing, and we so we're all, you know going to be able to expand that. But yeah, we want to make it really easy for people to know what they can do um, to support uh, the kind of growing movement of rewilding. And why is it so important to the? environment to, to climate change why, why is this an important part of the puzzle so many reasons why i mean fundamentally nature is our life support system so it's it's important to sustain the living systems on which we depend uh, you know our, our atmosphere our clean air clean water healthy soils that will produce the food that we eat so i mean it's absolutely fundamental that we sustain that otherwise we can't sustain life on earth i mean that, that's the bottom line really um but nature brings what we say is um naturally functioning ecosystems so in a sense that means the sort of very dynamic complex habitats or mosaics of habitats that we see we kind of intuitively know when we look on the tv through a sort of screen through a square hole as it were into this parallel universe where there is uh, where there are places like that in sort of David Attenborough documentaries, for instance, and 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 it's interesting the level of interest in Britain. We've got we're a nation of nature lovers, but we don't kind of yeah. realise that disconnect between what that looks like mm -hmm. and what's happening outside our our windows. Um, so we want to see those really dynamic sort of webs of life starting to build themselves back up again, and those provide lots of things. They sequester a lot of carbon, for instance. So. They're a really effective tool in drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and helping us to get to net zero or even negative. The land is vital for that as this sort of, in a sense, over, only proven technology for, for sequestering carbon. It also provides health and well-being. We, we know now and after the COVID pandemic even more just how important access to nature and wilder nature is to people's sense of well-being. We know that it's really important and a very cost-effective mechanism of reducing the risk of flooding, for instance, to not put in massive engineering works, but just rewild the catchments of, of the river so that water soaks in in the uplands, uh, you slow the flow, you reduce those peaks um, that c create flooding. So there's just this amazing myriad of things that nature provides and and I feel it's quite shameful that we're one of the most nature depleted countries on earth. So that's what we want to do something about. But we want to prove that, you know, there's this there's this sort of pledge that leaders across the world have made of 30 percent for nature by 2030. And that was then reiterated at this big conference called COP15, which is the sort of big global biodiversity conference similar to the um, COP26 and COP27 with the global climate 
conferences and leaders then in December reiterated that pledge. So we want to, in line with that, we want to see rewilding across 30% of, of Britain. I mean, not all um, what we might call core rewilding, but a sort of spectrum of rewilding, again, leading from gardens into parks, into river corridors, out into the countryside. And these areas should be where we prioritise nature for all the wonderful things it brings and for the jobs that it can sustain. And we feel that the benefits of that will be massive and the trade-offs will be much smaller than people anticipate. So it's often said that we can't rewild, we don't have enough space in Britain, we're too um, overpopulated and we need to prioritise food production because of the sort of food security issues. When actually we want to prove that at the the reduction in food production, if we commit to 30% rewilding, is going to be really minimal and can be compensated for relatively easily. So there's massive benefits and very few trade-offs to committing and saying as a nation, we want to restore nature for all the amazing things it brings and the benefits it brings to people and to communities as a sort of overriding aim. It's so important what you're doing. I just I just love it. I think it's amazing. And I was as you were talking about the flooding issue, I was thinking about that story about the beavers who naturally made flood defences, didn't they? There was some area, I don't know where it was, and maybe you'll know, but and the beavers had just done it, hadn't they? They just created a natural flood defence. Well, they're an amazing example of what is called an ecosystem engineer. Um, so they create, they you know, chop down trees, create wetlands because they hold back the flow of, of rivers. They create these amazing sort of mosaic of pools. And I mean, even the, the trees that they chop down are important because that dead wood is also important to, to kind of increase the complexity almost of 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 the habitat um, and then they flow they hold the water back and reduce those flood peaks because what happens now is the rain falls it falls on the uplands that has very little vegetation flashes down our rivers and there's nothing to stop it or slow the flow so we have these massive peak flows and that's what creates the flooding so beavers do that for free <laughs> i mean <they're, laughs> yeah. there there are moments that need to be managed because we don't want that to then flood massive areas of farmland, for instance, but they, those things can be relatively easily managed and mitigated uh, and, uh, you know, create relatively small problems compared to the benefits. And when you were talking about how the land can hold carbon, I was reminded that I've learned recently that uh, from um, If Women Rose, rooted by Dr. Sharon Blackie, who's another guest on my podcast soon. And in that, she writes about how a peat bog can hold carbon. I had no idea that it, it's you know that it's a really good way of getting rid of excess carbon to have the peat bog there. And people just think it's a bog. You know, they don't realise how important this part of our landscape is to the whole ecosystem, as as you were talking about. Yes, our, our sort of peatlands and peat bogs are, are vital, really. Uh, at the moment, they're a net carbon emitter because we are because they're degraded. They're often drained. We're continuing to remove peat to put in compost for gardeners. On many areas, that peatland is being burnt for on grouse moors, for instance. But if restored, they could be one of our uh, major net carbon sequesterers. That's the wrong word, but um, <laughs> because. What they do is when you've got these amazing sphagnum mosses, they start to lay down peat and will carry on doing that indefinitely. And that is trapping the, the carbon in the, on a continuous basis. So they could turn very quickly if restored on a massive scale in, from a net emitter to a net sequesterer. <laughs> I just think I'm, I'm always fascinated by when, when we make changes and we don't think about the consequences and then we make a mess. Um, and that, that is what we keep doing, isn't it? We just keep developing and changing things and bringing in, I mean, just to, to women's diets and not just women, but our diets or, or our products and, and all of these unnatural things. And actually that taking it all back to nature is really where we need to go. 
for our own health as much as the world's health. Absolutely. And, and to learn from nature. So nature is um, this amazing system. And I think what you have to do is to embrace the complexity of that and to understand how the system as a whole operates. And we have a tendency to sort of break down and silo things uh, into sort of different parts rather than trying to build them back up and understand how the system as a whole operates. And an amazing naturally functioning ecosystem is, is it's almost a lesson in this is how systems work. And if you tweak one thing, you've got to think about, is that going to create a positive change or potentially this negative feedback loop that will cre create something that you really hadn't anticipated? So rewilding is all about putting the kind of ingredients, the processes back into that system to create this dynamic complexity that, again, is what you kind of uh, almost intuitively know when you see a David Attenborough documentary, um, what an amazing rainforest in the Amazon or some of the other um, complex habitats. So there's a, a really interesting documentary called The Serengeti Rules, which is all about trophic cascades and keystone species, which sounds like a lot of technical words, but it's just a way of saying that it's not a simple system. It's a really complex one. And that's what makes it amazing. If you take these keystone species out, like beavers, for instance, the whole kind of complexity collapses. It's almost like, um, and they're called keystone species because it's like the arch, an arch, and it's the stone at the top of the arch that gives it its stability. And so if you take the, that stone out, the arch collapses. So if you take beavers out, the complexity of the system collapses and you get these downgraded ecosystems. And then it's quite difficult to, to kickstart them and get them functioning again, unless you put those amazing species back in and let them sort of recreate that ecosystem dynamism. Yeah. So what are those keystone species? Well, things like... What are some of them? Um, like uh, beavers, uh, for instance, or... As a, in the Serengeti rules, they highlight sea otters uh, on the west coast of the United States. So you take sea otters out and sea otters eat sea urchins. Sea urchins eat sea kelp, and it's the kelp that gives it the structural complexity. They create these amazing kind of gardens that other species and small fish can live in. So if you take the otters out, the urchins uh, populations explode. They eat all the sea kelp and the whole system collapses. So that's kind of another example of those yeah, yeah. The, the, the importance of those particular species. Now, I've heard you talk about um, some species that you would love to see reintroduced to Britain. What, what are those? Oh, uh, we'd love to see lynx, for instance, return as a species that you know, creates, they're returning quite quickly across a lot of Europe, for instance. Beavers, we'd, you know, we've, we've got them now which is fantastic. We've got wild populations in, in Scotland and, and in England, but I'd like to see those expand, those populations expand. But it's not just about the, what, you know, the sort of iconic species. I think there are, there are smaller species, like uh, we have a European tree frog, for instance, that is a native species to, to Britain that I'd like to see return. Um, I think there are species of plants and the diversity of of plants that so I think it's kind of thinking about all those different levels and not jo just those species that people t tend to associate with rewilding like lynx and, and wolves they might be the icing on the cake that might happen in a generation's time but we need to kind of build back in that kind of complexity and allow species to to just emerge and you know one of the things about climate change is that we, it's going to be very uncertain. We, we're not really going to know how species are going to adapt to the warming that is already built in. I mean, we know that climate zones are moving about five kilometers a year, which means that some species are not going to be able to live in in the areas that they live in because it's going to warm too much. So they, they're going to need to move. They've proved that one of the key factors in avoiding species loss because of that is creating those corridors and that connectivity through the landscape so that if they do need to move they've got something to somewhere to move to for example it's so important i mean just last summer i found a swift that had fallen on the ground and i got in touch with swift rescue and uh, i was told that there were a lot of swifts and a lot of a type of gull 
that was really suffering because the roofs that they used to, that they nest in are too hot they get too hot and therefore they fly early and then they die because they're trying to fledge too early and then that's happening and i see it as well because every day not every day but most days i go and i walk along my river um my river <laughs> the new river and uh, I feed the swans and I feed the Egyptian geese and all the ducks. And the Egyptian geese get really confused by the weather. And then they're having a brood in February. And of course, then it gets super cold and the brood just dies. Literally, it hatches one day, dies the next. And that's just terrible. But that is, even on my doorstep, I'm seeing how confused nature is and how it's suffering from from what's happening to the climate. I mean, that's an interesting example because Egyptian geese, of course, are non-native species, which is probably why they're yeah. <laughs> But it may be that they acclimatise better than um, yeah. other species. But I suppose it's also important to mention that for us, rewilding isn't just about nature, it's about people. People are part of nature. And I, I think that kind of separation that we've created, almost like sort of people are over, over here and nature's over there, as if we're not just another species, that is part of that ecosystem. We just happen to be taking up a bit more space and resources than than we should do. So what works for nature has to also work for people. So our principles of rewilding are that people and communities are key and that that rewilding has to sustain and diversify local livelihoods and local communities. So we um have done a report on what we call nature-based economies. So if we're, if we're really going to get nature's recovery across 30% of Britain, we need nature-based economies, that is, ac across that same area, because we need economies that s support and sustain nature, but also in turn provide local jobs and livelihoods and sustain communities and get communities more involved. I mean, we'd love to see more community-led projects. For instance, we're working with a group in southern Scotland called the Langham Initiative. And there the community did a community buyout of an ex grouse moor, a large area that had been previously managed for grouse. And now it's owned by the community and they are doing, they are linking nature's restoration with community regeneration. We'd love to see a lot more of that happening across Britain. Communities getting more involved and having more of a stake and and yeah and and potentially owning and managing a lot more areas of land uh, so that there is that sense of of engagement and and also community benefit from from what's happening from from what's happening with nature but what uh, looking at the diversification of of jobs for instance um so some people say that you know rewilding will just will mean kicking people off the land and will mean an end to a lot of the livelihoods uh, of people working on the land, but we don't see that it in in that way at all. It's about creating a kind of just transition, as they as say. To I mean, we know that we need to take action. We know that that will imply change, which I think is can be very threatening for people. But that change can help sustain those communities, and those local communities need to be part of that and and part of driving that too. And how are businesses responding? I mean, I think w one of the propositions that we put in this report on nature-based economies is that we'd love to see nature-based enterprise zones, for instance, established so that business is supported and, and incentivized to think how can we, what new businesses can we develop um, linked to nature's recovery or compatible with nature's recovery? So, and another criticism of rewilding is sometimes, well, the only jobs that it will create maybe are in ecotourism and that will give very few local jobs. And those local jobs will just be cleaning holiday cottages and seasonal. But it's it's much wider than that, I think. I mean, <laughs> for instance, I always joke that the huge growth in, in um, local gins using wild forage products, for instance, botanicals, I think is an interesting one. So some of the network members that we have have set up well-being centers or producing bottled water or local gins or 
I mean, I don't, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to. There was a sort of fad in in bottling birch water, sort of water tapped out of a tree, for instance. So there may be any number of of enterprises that could be linked, but also that we need to recognise that most of the people that live in rural areas don't actually work on the land; they work for the local councils or in in shops and businesses. And it's it's about sort of ensuring that those local economies as a whole both support and benefit from rewilding. Yeah, there's a lot to do, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot to do. Yes. I'm glad somebody's doing it, though. I'm, I'm I just, yeah, I think it's amazing. It's really interesting to hear how it can impact us all and how we can all get involved, you know, at a local level, at a national level, at a vocal level, at an active level. There's all, di- all sorts of different ways. Yep. Yeah. So what frustrates you about <laughs> what you do, what you're trying to do? Um, oh, that's a very good question. What frustrates me? Some people frame rewilding as, as very polarized and that we sort of, that, that farmers and foresters and, you know, that we're all in our different camps and all oppose each other and that there's conflict. And I, I don't see it in that way at all. I don't think it, I think there's a lot more common ground than is often portrayed. And what I'd like to see, I mean, and what has to happen is those different stakeholders, I suppose, or those that are important in making rewilding happen need to come together uh, and find that common ground and sort of almost stand back and we need as a nation to ask ourselves, what are we asking of the land and the sea? Because, you know, obviously marine rewilding is an, is an element in this. Um, what do we want it to provide for us and how do we want to nurture it? So, of course, we need food production and we need to increase, constantly increase the effectiveness and the productivity of that food production. But we all know we can't carry on producing food in the same way that we have done and we also need to address the climate emergency and the ecological emergency. We need to improve people's access to nature. We need to avoid the flooding that has happened. We need to ensure clean supplies of water and that we've got resistance to potentially the sort of droughts that are coming and the changing climate. Uh, so we need to have that kind of conversation almost and then come to an agreement that we do need food production, we need timber production. But we also need to prioritize the, you know, in a sense, the productivity of nature. It's, some say that, oh, again, we can't rewild because we, it's, it's not a productive use of the land. Well, we see it as an incredibly productive use of the land. And if we sort of shifted that mindset almost and people stopped sort of thinking in silos, then there is a huge amount of common ground in addressing that kind of the, the needs that we have uh, of the land and sea and the resources within them. So how do you keep going? Because this is this is hard work and there must be days when, well, there would be days for me where I go, oh, is this worth it? You know, well, obviously it's worth it. But for you personally, how, how, how do you keep going? Well, I suppose I feel I feel very lucky to be working in an area that is is so hopeful. Um, it is a really positive solution that we can all get behind. In, in a sort of sea of, I suppose, quite challenging solutions. So we're not telling people to stop doing anything. We're saying that we can all get involved in in seeing this amazing mosaic of of, of habitats return and, and all the amazing species that come with that. And so, you know, that's what keeps me going. And I suppose the affirmation that uh, of sort of public support that is is emerging which is really heartening. You know, for instance, last year we got involved in a garden at the Chelsea Flower Show that was this amazing beaver garden, it was, uh, and it won. <laughs> it was this kind of recreation of a wet woodland that a, a, a beaver would be living in with a beaver dam and a beaver pond. It didn't have an actual beaver in it, but... <laughs> <laughs> and what was amazing, what, one, that it won, but two was the conversations that we had with all the people that came to visit it because we had staff at at the garden all through the week and just hearing people's interest in and curiosity about and fascination with and 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 the hopeful sort of messages that came with that was just 
so life affirming, I suppose. So it's things like that that, that keep me going. Um, so, you know, I feel very, very blessed, I suppose, to even on the days when it all feels a bit overwhelming. I mean, we're also blessed by the staff that work with us because we've been really lucky to attract some just great people who, again, are very dedicated to the cause, but also have great skills to offer. So that, you know, that that makes coming to work, even though we're all working from home, a pleasure. And what would you, what would you most like people to know about rewilding Britain and what you're doing in this whole initiative? What would you, what would you, would you most like people to know? I think that that change is possible. It's not this sort of overwhelming and daunting proposition that we can commit to restoring nature on a on a really large scale, not just a few nature reserves here and there, a few pockets of nature that we allow to happen, but we can make a decision to restore this amazing abundance. And it's not unprecedented. For instance, Costa Rica as a nation made a similar decision a number of years ago that they were going to invest in restoring their natural resources and their economy has benefited massively from it. Um, Actually, their GDP has gone up. So I suppose it's it's that. It's, it's that let's work together, let's come together and go for that ambitious level of change. I mean, we think as an organization that we, we want to sort of think big and act wild and we'd love others to come along with us on that journey. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, follow and share it. Also, giving a five-star review really helps get the word out. You'll find the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you can get my book, Magnificent Midlife, Transform Your Middle Years, Menopause and Beyond. Make the very best of your next chapter. Help me change the world, one magnificent midlife woman at a time.